Good evening, and welcome to this webinar on uh, on ridge preservation and extraction socket management. So I have a, a practice up here in, in the north, just, out, just outside Manchester, and um, I'm limited really to implants, and what I do a lot of is ridge preservation and taking teeth out, obviously. Now, if you don't know me, I am a dentist with issues. I have issues with her. Her name is Alison Hagman, and she was the actress in Bandcamp. I also have a few with, uh, with her, Al McPherson. I don't have too many issues with Al McPherson, but uh, I do have issues with her. I have issues with her, Jane Fonda. Now, the reason why I have issues with all these women is they're absolutely beautiful women, aren't they? They're gorgeous, and Jane Fonda is 75 years old. El McPherson is over 50, and Alison Hagman is, is over 40. And look how wonderful they look. And it's the same for the men. And I have issues with Johnny Depp and Harrison Ford. Because look at them with all their teeth and their, their trendy little earring there. And the issues I have with them is that it's because of these actors and actresses all of our patients are expecting to have this sort of gleaming smile well into the 60s, 70s and 80s. Gone are the days of the, of the gappy granny. And it's all about the aesthetics nowadays. And when you look at why these guys need their teeth, for sure, we need them for, um, for mastication. And when I ask my patients about, about this and you know, why do you want your teeth re replaced, a lot of it is about um, the ability to eat their food, but a lot of it is also about how they look to their friends and their family. How long does it take for them to eat their, eat their meal? And it's a lot about the way they appear to their friends and family. Most people manage okay with speech and stuff, but again, we need our teeth for support. And when we ask our patients about you know, how you feel when we take a tooth out, it's not really about the function. They care about the most common question I get asked is, you know, will my face collapse if I have this molar tooth taken out? It's all about the aesthetics. And it's right when you think about it because this is probably the most packed person in the whole of the, the UK. And, you know, do you think she would really have just given birth to the second in line to the throne and indeed is a mother of the heir in line to the throne if she looked like this? I don't think, uh, I don't think she would have. And it's not just these young, beautiful women. The vanity nowadays is not just uh, the privilege of the young. And as I say, we have people from all ages expecting to have this perfect smile. And this is what they want. This is what they're looking for. They want to have this, this perfect emergence profile. They want to have the intact dental papilla. They want to have the, pros the prosthetic tooth unit, which is indistinguishable from the adjacent tooth. They want to have the, con the convex uh, gingival um, profile. And when I first started getting into implant dentistry many years ago, 15 years ago, it was very much all about the tooth surface. It was all about how the implant integrated with the bone. And the last na international conference that I, that I attended, there was about 40 lectures. Only one of them was about the... The, the implant itself. The other 39 lectures are all about the soft tissue and the aesthetics, and it's thanks to these film stars that have raised the expectation of our, of our patients. And it's difficult for us because when our patients present to us nowadays, they look like this. You know, they've got uh, hard and soft tissue defects, their, their margins aren't their, their, their gingival profile isn't, isn't coincident, they've lost the interdental papilla, they've got stained ugly teeth, and they want to look like a film star. And so it's very, very, very challenging for us. Luckily this case went okay for me. I mean, I did some, some veneers on, on her and I, and I did some, some soft and some hard tissue grafting and I was quite happy with the result in the end. You know, I, I was quite pleased. <laughs> of course, I didn't really do this case. But the point I'm making is that long ago are the days when this was acceptable, when we could have these long clinical crowns and these gingival margins which are, are not co coincident with the adjacent teeth. 
And we've got to think of ways that we can stop this happening, where we can manage that in the, in the long term. So the objectives for my talk this evening are to, to look at how we evaluate and treatment plan some of our cases when we remove a tooth and, and what we need to, to think about in terms of the long term and how we can help uh, achieve the aesthetic results that we need. Um, how we can take the tooth out uh, to preserve as much of the bone as possible to, improve, to help improve the aesthetics. And then what can we do at the point of extraction just to prevent some of that soft and hard tissue loss? So first of all, what stops us getting that aesthetic result? What are the risk factors that may affect um, whether or not we can achieve the aesthetic result when we come to rehabilitate the space? So what stops us getting this result when we put a prosthetic tooth unit in? Well, I've listed them here for you. The, um, the amount of buckle bone you have when you take a tooth out, how long the tooth has been missing for, the, uh, whether they've got a history of periodontal disease, the soft tissue biotype, the lip line of the patient, the shape of the teeth, uh, and if there's multiple uh, missing teeth. And one of the key things in implant dentistry and one of the key take-home messages um, for this, this lecture this evening is that this is a phrase by Garber and it's tissue is the issue but bone sets the tone and one of the key concepts in implant dentistry is that it's the bone that supports the soft tissue if you lose the bone you lose the soft tissue so a lot of our treatment planning protocols are all about getting the bone right because if we get the bone right then the soft tissue will naturally follow. So when we come to take a tooth out and we start to look at the extraction socket, it's this buccal bone that we can see here, which is really sacred to us. We want to do everything we can to uh, maintain that buccal plate because it's that buccal plate that supports the soft tissue. If we lose the buccal plate, then it's very, very difficult for us to regenerate it and to regenerate the aesthetics um, when we come to rehabilitate the tooth unit. And it's challenging because in many cases that buccal plate is only half a millimeter thick. And we, in the majority of cases, we do lose some of that buccal plate. And the reason why we lose it is we lose the, the bundle bone that supports the parental ligament. And the bundle bone surrounds 0.3 of a millimeter, the, the socket. So if that buccal plate is only 0.5 millimeters thick and you're losing 0.3 millimeters of it, straight away you're going to lose the majority of that buccal plate. And we need that buccal plate to support the soft tissues. And there's been lots and lots of studies, and mainly on uh, Scandinavian dogs, about what happens when we to take a tooth out and how that buccal plate remodels and how it resorbs over time. But it does in most cases, and so we end up with a loss of width um, where the tooth is removed and an ev an ev uh, evidently some loss of height. And you can see, you can see why here, uh, uh, this, um, this cross section, you can see how thin that buccal plate is. And so we know we're going to lose some of it. And if it's a traumatic extraction, you can imagine losing most of it. So we lose that hard tissue and then we lose that soft tissue. Uh, and therefore you end up with a, with a longer clinical crown if you don't do something to regenerate the site. And there's lots and lots of research and evidence about how much we lose and uh, how much, how, what, what volume of bone um, we lose and over what period of time. And these are just a couple of papers I put together. You know, we lose half of the width during the first, first year in a, in, a, in, a, in a majority of cases. Uh, two thirds of the bone loss occurs within the first three months. And of course, there's a range of, of figures there um, in, those, in, those, in those other papers. But if that isn't bad enough, and if that isn't challenging enough, I said in, in, in a lot of cases, the, the buccal plate is only half a millimeter thick. In some cases, in 11% of cases, there isn't a buccal plate. It's so thin, we can't even detect it on CT scans. And you can see some examples here of a dehiscence type defect. 9% of people have natural dehiscences and 11% of people have natural fenestrations. So there's hardly anything there to start with. So in these people, it's incredibly difficult um, 
to regenerate the site because you've got no buckle plate there in, in, the, uh, in the first place. And if that isn't bad enough, as you go through time, we know that the bone remodels and you start to lose bone through our normal remodeling process. And of course, we are all familiar with the, with the work of Kay Wood and Howe. And we know why this happens. This happens because bone reacts to strain. And if there's no strain on the bone, the body doesn't want to be carrying all this heavy, heavy bone around, so it starts to get rid of it. And, you know, this is best demonstrated in our edentulous patients, and we all, we all know these the consequences of, of the edentulous arches. And so time is a huge factor. But what about periodontal disease? Well, most periodontal disease, you have bone loss, and so you have no bone supporting it, so if you took all these, all these teeth out, you would have recession, because you need the bone to support the soft tissues. And I see case after case where um, they have parental disease and it's incredibly difficult for me to regenerate the hard tissue and therefore the soft tissue prior to implant placement. And I do quite a lot of medical legal work and this is just a medical legal case. This patient presented to her dentist and uh, it was just slight pocketing around this tooth and um, through one reason or another they went to refer it to a periodontist and the referral got lost etc etc and um, a couple of years later she presented and the tooth was like this and I just had to take the tooth out and um, and then we have to think about how we can regenerate this but you can see we've lost the bone and therefore we've lost the soft tissue and therefore we have to regenerate the bone um, in order to um, have a reasonable soft tissue profile. So I removed the tooth, I caressed all the granulation tissue out, we root plane the adjacent central incisor, we put our implant in and we grafted the side and we generated all the bone and then of course uh, we can replace the flap and the, and the soft tissue will cover that nicely. Another huge factor is the type of tissue that we have. So if you have a thin, a person with a thin soft tissue biotype and unfortunately this is 70% of, of our patients are like this and you can tell because the, their soft tissue does look thinner they've got longer taller interdental papilla they tend to have a more triangular shaped tooth and what's interesting is the research shows that these people are the people that will have a very very thin buccal plate or these fall into that 11 or 9% of people which have natural fenestrations and dehiscences. So not only do they have very, very thin tissue with tall interdental papilla, which is difficult enough to manage, they also have very thin buccal plates. So when you take the tooth out, you're very likely to destroy what, what hard tissue, what bone, there is supporting that soft tissue. These people don't get pockets, these people get recession. And they're incredibly difficult to, to deal with. And in contrast, about 30% of our patients have a thick tissue biotype. And these are much easier to deal with. These have much squarer teeth, they have much flatter interdental papilla, they have thick tissue which is easy for us to manage surgically. They tend to have nice thick buccal bones. And so they're very easy to preserve that buccal plate. They're very easy to do surgery on and because of the, the flat interdental papilla and the square of teeth, it's very easy to regenerate the, the aesthetics that we need. So the assessment of the biotype is critical and what's interesting is when you go to all these aesthetic conferences, they very rarely show these thin tissue biotypes because it's very difficult to achieve the aesthetic results that you require. But they're all this type because it's easy. Um, it's easy to achieve the aesthetics because of, because of their um, biotype and their anatomy. And, you know, you can go through some of the film stars and pop stars and you can look at what sort of biotype they are. And if this guy walks into your surgery, you know, you, you, you should be panicking a little bit because not only does he have um, a thin biotype, he has very tall interdental papilla, he has very triangular shaped teeth, and of course look at his smile line, I'm not entirely sure he has an upper lip. Um, and so he'd be one where it'd be very difficult for us to regenerate that here, the aesthetic result that he'd require, and it's on show. What makes it worth is, is he is a film star. And when you look at other people, for example, this is my wife and, and her grandmother. And I'm sure most of you, when you, 
when you go to bed at night and you're looking longingly into your into your partner's eyes, you're imagining imagining running along a beach holding hands or whatever. I'm not. I'm looking at my wife's teeth and I'm looking at her lateral incisor there thinking, Christ, please never ever lose your lateral incisor. She has a thin tissue biotype. You can almost make out the root um, of the lateral incisor there through the soft tissue. You know that she's got no buccal plate there. You know if you take that lateral incisor out, all that tissue will just collapse unless we do something about it. And believe you me, she's demanding. She would want the aesthetic result. She would want exactly the same end result as, as she has there. Whereas her grandmother is totally different. That's her smiling, which is why there are some cracks um, uh, on her face there. And um, uh, she's got a very low smile line and of course aesthetics is much, much less demanding. Multiple miss missing teeth are a risk factor for us because when you take multiple teeth out, you lose the intercentral papilla. And it's incredibly difficult for us to, to regenerate that, that interdental papilla. So there are some of the things we need to think about when we take a tooth out and some of the assessments we need to make, uh, keeping a, a mind on the end aesthetic result. So how do I take out a tooth that's preserving that buccal plate, which hopefully preserves the soft tissue, which hopefully then makes it easier to achieve the aesthetic results that these film stars demand now that all our patients uh, expect. Well, there's a number of things, and there's a number of things that um, I wasn't taught as an undergraduate. And the first one was from a friend of mine in the States called um, Carl Misch. He wrote, he wrote the textbook on uh, dental implantology. In fact, it's the most widely sold textbook in dentistry worldwide. And, and this graph is from is from that book, and it's reported um, it's reporting the work from Riley. And what Carl Misch talks about is he says that we really need to understand the biomechanics of the bone before we can start to effectively uh, remove a tooth, particularly if you want to remove it atraumatically. But of course, you can never remove a tooth totally traumatically, so we call it minimally traumatic. And what this graph is showing is the, the deformation of the bone if you put a force onto it. And what Carl Mesh explained to me is that when you put a force onto the bone, it's very, very, very good at absorbing that force for about a minute. So you can you can be doing what you like to do. You can put in pressure on it. You can be doing whatever movement you want, but you, the bone is very, very good at absorbing that force for about a minute. However, after a minute, it just gives. It just, it just gives. And you can see on the graph there, you've got a bit of deformation, about 10% straight away, and then it resists all your forces for about a minute, and then it just gives. And this, this is one of the unique biomechanical characteristics of bone. And the second thing that he explained to me is that we need to understand the biomechanics of the parental ligament. And the ligament is extremely good at resisting forces and compression. It's 30% weaker in tension, but it's 65% weaker at resisting forces, um, uh, shear forces. So how Carl Misch suggests that we should be taking out teeth is that we should put a force onto a tooth, a constant force, and just hold it for a minute. Don't do anything else, just hold it for a minute. Because anything you do during that first minute is going to be absorbed by the bone. And the other thing we should be doing is having a slight rotational force on the tooth whilst we're holding that force on there. And when I when he was first telling me about this, I read this in his book, I tried it. I, I, I'd taken out, um, I think it was a canine, and I put this constant force on, and I just held it, and I was chatting to the patient about her day, and I was telling her about my day, and I was telling her about Kalmish, and I held it for a minute, and a constant force, and I had a rotational force in my wrist, and after a minute, the tooth just came out in my hand. And it really is uncanny how effective this, this, this protocol is. And it's something which I would suggest you all try. So it's a constant force for a minute, and you have a rotational force, and you can do that with all teeth. And, and I'll tell you how you do that in a, in a second. And the problem, though, when you have multi-rooted teeth is that when you put a rotational force onto it, of course, 
the, uh, the anatomy of the, rules of the roots themselves resist this rotation of force. So one of the things that I do do routinely is I section, I section teeth before I take them out for two reasons. First of all, I can better preserve that inter, inter, um, interdental bone and I can also put on this um, rotational force which makes me take the teeth out so much more easily which then in, makes me not need to do these secondary movements uh, which uh, can damage the buccal plate which then can compromise the end aesthetic result. So in actual fact I don't really do any secondary movements at all other than this rotation. And you know just be a bit careful um, don't forget about the lingual nerve when you're sectioning uh, lower lower sixes and sevens it is surprisingly superficial in that area as I'm sure you're all aware. 70% of the implants that I place are due to failed post crowns and it's understandable isn't it people are reluctant to do, to do these long post crowns because if they perforate that's iatrogenic so I see lots and lots of shorter post crowns which of course causes root fracture and um, and then I have to put an implant in. But the problem I have is because quite often the root is fractured, as soon as you put your forceps on it, the whole lot just falls apart. So you can't put this rotational force on. So one of the things that I do is I fill the post hole up with something like Ketac silver or glass armor or something, which gives you a nice solid tooth root to get hold of without the tooth collapsing. And I find that makes it much easier to take out these teeth which have supported post crowns historically. The other thing which I use quite frequently is um, a periotome and for those of you who don't know what a periotome is, it's a device that we use to physically cut the periodontal ligament. So we go along and the end of this, the end of this instrument is very sharp and we just work this down the, down the, uh, the periodontal ligament um, before we start to take the tooth out. We do this for two reasons. First of all, it starts a, an enzyme reaction in the uh, the ligament which starts to cause the ligament to break down uh, and secondly you're physically mechanically cutting the ligament uh, and of course you can get a good a good hold on onto the tooth so that's called a periotome and the way that you use that is you just work it down the tooth um, at about 30 degrees so you're physically sort of cutting the ligament because all this is about taking the tooth out, trying to preserve that buccal bone because it's the buccal bone that's keeping the soft tissue there, that's maintaining our aesthetics that our patients now expect thanks to Johnny Depp. There's a clinical picture. Another thing that you can try is something called physics forceps. Now, what these do is you can see that there's a, there's a bumper there which you put on the, uh, the buccal or the labial um, uh, sulcus and then you have a claw which which engages into the lingual or the platelet and then all you do is you just squeeze now how these work is they're exactly the same as what I described before you squeeze them and then you just hold it for a minute and the tooth just dislodges from the socket it's applying those exact same principles that I told you about um, when we looked at that um, deformation graph um, from the work of Riley and so you, you use these purely to dislodge the tooth from the um, from the socket and then you put your normal conventional extraction forceps on and then you deliver the tooth. So all this is doing is it's automatically doing that one minute of constant force for you that we discussed earlier. Um, they're quite expensive, it's about a thousand pounds for the four that you saw there but they're, they're quite good at delivering that primary movement, that, that primary force, that constant primary force um, and delivering the tooth uh, as minimally traumatic as possible so we can preserve that buccal plate. Um, there are lots of gimmicks on the market as well. Um, this is uh, called Extractees. Um, I don't really have much experience with these because I find them a bit um, gimmicky that for this one for example you have to virtually root fill the tooth before you can you can take it out you've got to screw posts into them and things and then you just put a constant force on like a like more like a, um, a cork out of a wine bottle but um, so I don't tend to use these type of things if I have a very very difficult tooth um, to remove um, uh, we have special tips for our piezo machines where we physically cut the tooth out uh, in a case like this for example where you, you stand little chance of 
of removing the tooth without uh, having to remove some bone as well. And the key aim here is to preserve that buccal plate. I can't emphasize. I can't emphasize that enough. So we've assessed our risks. We've we've learned some techniques on how we can on how we can remove the tooth as minimally traumatic as possible. Um, when do we need to do some ridge preservation and what is ridge preservation? Well, what ridge preservation is, is is doing something to the extraction socket to stop that buccal plate resorbing and to maintain it so that it maintains a soft tissue. And how it works is when your extraction socket um, heals, for sure we knew we were going to lose some of the buccal plate because uh, we're losing the bundle bone, we've discussed that. But then, stretch heals, your connective tissue, your endothelial cells grow down into the extraction socket, and some of your osseous cells grow up into the extraction socket. The problem is that your connective tissue turns over at a much higher rate than your, than your bone does. So you end up with a ridge that looks like this. If there's some way that you can exclude the connective tissue, the only thing that can happen is that the osseous, you have osseous upgrowth into the extraction socket. And this is the whole concept and the whole principle of, uh, of guided bone regeneration. And so there are a number of questions that we need to ask ourselves. And when I started doing ridge preservation, I wanted to know that what I was doing was Uh, is that going to preserve this buccal plate? Can you hear me now? I'm assuming that you can hear me. Um, I'll just run over that last bit again. Uh, there are two main questions that I wanted to know when I started doing ridge preservation. First of all, is there any evidence to show that it actually works? Is there any evidence to show that by doing something to the extraction socket, do I preserve that buccal plate and stop this bony remodeling in order to preserve the aesthetics? And um, if it does, does that help with the end result? Does that help with the aesthetics um, at the end as a, as a patient-centered outcome? And there's lots of evidence out there um, for this, and obviously we go for the highest level of evidence, which is um, under a Cochrane review as a systematic review. And it says yes, it says ridge preservation results in less dimensional change than if you don't do that. Uh, it also says that uh, if we use some of these um, BMPs, these bone morphogenic proteins like PRF and all this sort of stuff, then that can offer further advantage. Um, but it doesn't come to a conclusion which material or technique is better at it. But we can we can dive deeper into it, and we can. There are specific um, case study series that looks at whether or not this is effective or not. And you know, some of these these are these are big names in dental implantology. Uh, Danny Boozer is one of um, Europe's leading implantologists, and um, he found that when you do do socket preservation. Um, then uh, it's effective at maintaining the bony dimensions, although you will still lose a little bit of the horizontal bone. And when you look specifically at um, using BioWAS, and, and the reason why um, uh, I'm talking about um, BioWAS today is because it's the one which has the highest level of research when it comes to um, socket preservation and ridge, uh, ridge preservation. And this is a case here that looked at 36 extraction sockets um, versus, and they, they put BioWAS into the extraction socket and um, uh, against a control where they didn't, and they found that they only lost 2.4 millimeters of, of height when they put BioWAS in, but they lost 5 millimeters height when they, when they didn't. And you know, there's lots of different studies as well. Here's another one that um, over 80% lost less than 20% of the volume of bone when you put BIOS in, whereas 71% um, uh, lost 
more than 20% of their bone volume when you didn't put bioas in. And so the conclusions of the literature is that doing something to the extraction socket most definitely helps preserve the bone, which preserves the soft tissue. And there are histomorphic, uh, histometromorphic um, studies as well which show the same and this is a nice example of how when you when you put something in the socket you can help maintain the ridge dimensions. So when do we do it? When do we do ridge preservation? Well any point you need to maintain the volume of the ridge and for me that's I need to put an implant in so I want to make sure I get the aesthetic result that I want by maintaining the ridge dimensions. Um, I also do a lot under pontics of a bridge. I don't want that um, that pontic site to resorb and compromise the long-term aesthetics. So I, I would add more. I would um, augment the ridge. And how you do it, how you decide whether or not you need to augment the ridge or not, is you need to um, classify the socket. And um, one of the things that I've done for, for my students and indeed for, for my referring dentists is that I've done some guidance papers and I can make sure you have a copy of all of these guidance papers. Um, and one of the guidance papers is how you classify an extraction socket. And where I've, I've done it so it's fairly straightforward and um, there's three main groups. It's adequate, it's compromised or it's deficient. If it's adequate, it means you've, you've got probably got a, a thick enough buccal plate there, you've got a thick um, tissue biotype. You don't really need to do much other than just um, make sure that you have a really good clot um, and, 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 that's, and that's all you need to do. Uh, diagrammatically for you there but there's also um, lots of papers that help us decide which is and um, and which is compromised and so I'll make sure you all have a copy of this guidance paper um, which uh, helps you classify your extraction sockets and then once you've classified your extraction socket within this guidance paper I've I've put together a little sort of chart of what you of what you can do. So if your extraction socket is adequate, you just ensure there's a good blood clot. If it's if it's um, if it's compromised, yes, you want to consider um, ridge preservation. Or if it's very deficient, then almost certainly you want to consider some sort of ridge ridge preservation. And as I say, going back, that is evidence based um, that protocol. So. The next question is, how do you do ridge preservation? So we know now how to assess our patients. We know how to take the tooth out as they traumatically as possible. We've looked at some of the indications for ridge preservation and how to classify the socket, but how do you actually do it? Well, again, I have a guidance paper on this and I've tried to make it as, as straightforward as we can. And again, I'll make sure you all have a, have a copy of, of this guidance paper of exactly how, how you would do it. Um, but what you would essentially do is you you make sure there's no um, there's no infection at all in the socket. You then fill the extraction socket with a with a biomaterial. Um, I do use um, BioOS, and then you cover that with a barrier membrane to stop the downgrowth of the um, of the connective tissue. And uh, you can use uh, a BioGuide to do that, or you can use one of these little um, mucograft plugs to do that. So here's just a clinical case so you can see exactly what I mean. In this case uh, the lower six and the lower five have failed. I only have a few millimeters above the ID nerve so it's absolutely critical that I maintain the bone volume. I can't afford to lose even a millimeter here really of bone uh, above the ID nerve because it makes the placement so much more uh, risky for the patient and it tips that risk benefit analysis that that I do on all my patients. So I want to make sure I lose as little bone as possible when I take these teeth out. So I use that technique, I'm, I, I section the teeth, I, I, and I do everything I can do to preserve the bony walls 
of that socket. I take it out, I'm very pleased with the way that the teeth have come out, the, the buccal walls are intact, the interdental bone's intact, everything's going exactly as I wanted to go to. The next thing I would do is I would very, very thoroughly get, get a curette or a spoon excavator or something like this, and I would correct the internal walls of the socket to make sure there's no soft tissue in there, because if there's soft tissue in there, that will proliferate rather than our osseous tissue. Um, starting to, to infill the extraction socket. So we, we really thoroughly clean out any soft tissue that's in there. And we really do spend a long time doing that. Um, and then you can use um, saline, you can buy little syringes of saline, or little bags of saline. And um, we fill the extraction socket with this biomaterial. And as I say, in this case, this is uh, bio-wash granules. I let the extraction socket fill up with blood first because that blood is critical in um, stabilizing the graft material and also uh, in providing the, uh, the the messenger molecules for angiogenesis and so let it fill up with blood so your nurses are very carefully aspirating the saliva away but they're letting the extraction socket fill up with blood and I'm using um, a, the granular form of BioWAS here, which um, we transfer from a pot. Another thing you can do is use a, a, a BioWAS, a BioWAS pen, which you can inject the uh, the biomaterial straight into the um, into the extraction socket. Um, or another thing you can do, which is which is incredibly easy to use, is something called BioWAS collagen, and that comes as a little block which you then can hydrate in your saline or in the patient's blood if you, if you, if you have any. And uh, that becomes a, 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 almost like a putty. It becomes quite a malleable block. And then you can just pop that into the extraction socket. Now, the key thing is when you're using these biomaterials, uh, whether you're using the, 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 col the bios collagen or whether you're using the, the bios particles in either the, 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 the the pen form or in, uh, from a vial, is that you don't pack it in um, aggressively. You need to just lightly tap this biomaterials into the socket. Because if you start packing it in like you're packing uh, amalgam in, first of all, you start to destroy the crystalline structure of the biowas, which is uh, fundamental for um, supporting osseous ingrowth into the material. But secondly, your patients will have incredible pain afterwards. If you just tap it in nice and gently, your patients have virtually no pain. If you pack it in, then your patients will be in excruciating pain um, afterwards. So a key point here is you just tap it in nice and gently and you allow all the, all the, the blood around there to, to set into a, into a clot. So a biomaterial now, you fill, you fill it up to about six eighths of the, uh, of the extraction socket. And then what I do is I just gently relieve the soft tissues so you have a, a little pocket, a little envelope just around the extraction socket. And, and then what you can do with that is you can just tuck a membrane and if you get the BioWAS collagen, the membrane comes with it as part of the pack. You can just, uh, you need to cut it to the right shape first, um, but then you can just tuck that under that soft tissue and that just protects your, um, your graft material and it acts as a barrier membrane to stop the, the downgrowth of the connective tissue into the extraction socket. And then you can just suture it up. And then I'm quite confident that I've done that all I can do, in this case to preserve the bony, um, the bony uh, volume above the ID nerve, and if this was in the aesthetic zone, I'm quite confident I've done everything I can do to maintain that buccal bone and to preserve the aesthetics for future implant placement or, 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 to, or to support the soft tissues under the pontic of a bridge. Sometimes if you haven't got a, a site which is quite as extensive as this or the extraction socket is really quite nicely intact and you're more concerned about the biotype evaluation that you've made, you don't need to, to use the membrane. You can use um, this um, mucograph seal, which you don't need to tuck under the periosteum you can just literally place that over your graft material and suture over it. And as I said, all of this, how to do all of this, how to classify your socket, and also how to carry out ridge preservation is on one of our guidance papers, which, um, which I will make sure you have a copy of um, from uh, the Geislick uh, uh, 
reps in your area. Um, I hope that was quite uh, a, a good tour for you on uh, ridge preservation and some of the indications, some of the practices that, that we do in our clinics. And um, if you have any questions at all, um, I'll be glad to answer them for you. We're just trying to find the questions now. So, so one of the questions was, um, what's the difference between uh, the way I use BioGuide and the way I use uh, Mucograft? So, uh, Mucograft is um, is a different product to to, to BioGuide, and uh, when I use uh, BioGuide, I actually, and I'll try to go back on the slideshow here if I can, if I can do that. Yeah. Uh, you can see uh, when you have a membrane, I actually tuck the membrane down uh, in between the bone and the periosteum. Whereas when I use this mucoseal, this mucograft mucoseal, um, it comes as a preformed plug which I literally just place over the extraction socket and then I do like a, a figure of eight suture or a, a vertical mat a horizontal mattress suture and just hold that in place. So can I explain why I, when I use BioWAS granules versus BioWAS collagen? Um, this is just pers a personal preference. Um, the, uh, the thing about the BioWAS collagen is it is 90% BioWAS granules, and it's just a question of um, of when you what, what works better in your hands. Um, yeah, the BioWAS collagen is, is slightly easier to use if you're not used to using the um, the guy stick products, but um, and it's easier to to, to shape it and, and mold it into the extraction socket. Um, I use more of the granules because I'm just used to, to using the granules more in my um, implant practice. But they're both equally as good as each other, and as far as I'm aware, the evidence is that they both work equally as well as each other. Yeah, so another question was, is there a, a situation where I would um, consider, rather than using the membrane or the, or the, or the, um, the mucograft seal, is there a situation I consider using um, a soft tissue, uh, a soft tissue graft? And uh, I used to do this quite a, quite a, quite a lot. Um, I used to just get a tissue punch, and I used to just take a punch from the palate, and then I used to suture that over the um, over the over the um, over the BioWAS. But I used to find in at least 60 or 70 percent of cases, the, um, the, 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 the soft tissue graft would just necrose and die and then just fall off. And, um, and then when you combine that with the fact that you have the trauma on the palate for the, for the patient and, um, and also the, my success it seems to be no different when I use BioGuide or when I use um, the Mucograft Mucoseal, then um, I just stopped doing it now and I just use these biomaterials all the time because um, it's much nicer for the patient and it's more predictable than, than doing that tissue punch. Um, if I desperately need to have a thicker band of keratinized tissue, I will get, um, I will go to the palate and, um, and take a um, uh, um, a connective tissue graft, and I may have some epithelium on there as well. But I do raise a proper full flap, and then I put that um, uh, actually a, a, like a split thickness flap design, so that the, the flap is being vascularized by the connective tissue, which is different to just taking a, a biopsy punch and um, and suturing it in place. So I think we have one more question. Um, and it was about the evidence of um, of um, of whether this works or not. And um, when I when I covered that, um, 
there are some systematic reviews and um, if I can just go back to the, to the systematic reviews um, uh, this this is um, the, the most recent systematic review and um, it does say it says that ridge preservation does work and interestingly it also says that um, it can't specify which material or technique works the best there isn't a level of evidence to, to say that so If there is no flap, how do you how do you stitch it? Yeah, you can do that in the same way that you would uh, you would you would uh, you would uh, if you had an extraction socket that was that was bleeding and you were you were trying to stop the bleeding and you do a horizontal match a horizontal mattress suture, you can um, you can just you can just suture over like that. Um, I tend to do it as a crisscross though because that keeps the membrane more stable. But you tend to find actually. Once you put your biomaterials in, these membranes, particularly the bioguide, is designed, it has two different sides. So it has a flat, a smooth side, and then it has a fluffy side. And when you're doing this, and this is noted in the guidance paper, the, um, the fluffy side has to go down. And the reason why the fluffy side goes down is because uh, this, the clot then sets into that fluffy side and that really does stabilize the membrane and so your sutures are only really there um, just to, to make sure everything stays stays together initially because as soon as that clot has hardened the membrane then becomes quite quite stable um, as does the, the, the bone augmentation material that you put into your extraction socket. So thank you very much for listening and, um, and uh, I think Richard wants to talk to you now about how you can introduce that into your practice and um, and uh, how uh, how your your particular how it relates to your particular situation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I just want to spend uh, a couple of minutes at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation here, <clears throat> just uh, building on the. Uh, the clinical presentation that Simon has uh, has given there, and just discuss ridge preservation and how it can work in terms of the uh, the business rationale. Um, so just a couple of quick slides, really. First of all, this is based on uh, on data provided from the Southern Dental Group, and it's looking at um, how implementing ridge preservation can uh, can can build revenue streams uh, that are otherwise not in place. So looking at uh, 80 practices with the equivalent of three full-time equivalent uh, clinicians placing, uh, extracting teeth within each practice, an average of two extractions per day, and you work on the basis of about 210 working days in a year. What that means is that uh, across the Southern Dental Group, there's roughly 100,000 extractions taking place. Obviously, you can see the split there between, uh, between NHS and private. The suggested cost per procedure for the ridge preservation pr procedure is, uh, is, is highlighted there, so about £200 on the NHS or £300 uh, private. That's obviously um, completely up to the individual clinician or group that's, that's undertaking the procedure. That's just an average of the uh, taken from the clinicians that do undertake this procedure. How many people are likely to take up? Um, well, that's obviously uh, to, to be seen, but We've based these uh, these projections on if 2% if of uh, NHS patients and 10% of private patients would have rich preservation done. That then leads to a potential revenue of £453,000 across the, uh, the Southern Dental Group when you extract the, uh, the anticipated material costs from that of £195,000. Leads you with a figure of about £258,000. Obviously, these are, are fairly rough calculations, but it's just designed to give you an idea of how implementing a new uh, technique such as this across the Southern Dental chain, business chain could actually increase the, uh, increase the revenue potential. To give you a particular example of uh, where ridge preservation can be, uh, can be applied and the, uh, the business case of, of, of how it might look, we can look at uh, a case example from a, from a late or a delayed implantation of an implant. So on the left hand side you can see with pre uh, ridge preservation the costs that you have there, the extraction, 
between £51 or £98, obviously depending whether it's NHS or private. The cost of the material, between £100 to £125, that's the cost of the Geishlik Combi Kit Collagen, depending on the volumes that you're purchasing. The cost of the ridge preservation procedure to the patient, between £200 to £300. So you would therefore be looking at a profit per procedure of around about £100. And one of the main reasons why you would undertake the ridge preservation procedure is that in 96% of cases, no additional augmentation is required. So if your patient is going on to have the implant placed, in 96% of cases, they do not need additional augmentation. So without ridge preservation, you can see obviously the cost of the extraction is the same, but the cost of the materials increases significantly because the patient is more likely to require a major bone augmentation at that stage. The total cost of the procedure also increases up to 600 to 1,000 pounds. So without preserving the ridge at the time of the extraction, if the patient is having a late implant, it can be a lot more expensive and complicated for the patient in the long run. That was just a very top line explanation in terms of how ridge preservation can be applied uh, as an additional revenue stream but obviously any questions please do feed them back into us and we can discuss that further with you. Just the final few slides of this evening's presentation. I mentioned at the, uh, the beginning of the webinar one of our partners for this event is, uh, is Dental Campus. Uh, Dental Campus is the world's number one provider for structured e-learning in implant dentistry and just a reminder that everybody that's logged in today will be sent a three-month voucher for free access to Dental Campus. Um, the content that you have on Dental Campus is um, a variety of online cases. You can review uh, live surgery videos and there is a vast library of lectures and, and videos which you can access obviously from home or from your office anytime that you like. You can discuss cases with your peers and compare results and you can create a network with dentists uh, worldwide. One of the nice features about Dental Campus is you can actually create um, an interactive uh, treatment profile from a patient case and you can compare that with, uh, with other cases from your peers. What I'd like to do is actually um, direct you to a specific case that will follow up nicely from the presentation that uh, the Dr. Wright has given this evening. Obviously there is a huge library of uh, clinical lectures available on Dental Campus so it's often nice to have uh, a useful starting point. So if you were interested in taking up the offer of the three month free uh, access to Dental Campus, I would suggest that you maybe go and look out this particular uh, lecture. It's ridge alteration after tooth extraction with uh, Dr. Mauricio Araujo, who is one of the, uh, the leading authorities in uh, extraction sockets and ridge preservation worldwide. So thank you very much for logging into the webinar this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it educational. You will receive an email uh, just to confirm that you will be receiving this three-month free voucher from Dental Campus. It does expire in 10 days, so if you are interested in taking that up, please do, uh, please do so within the first 10 days. And any questions, you can get in contact with, uh, with Dental Campus. So on behalf of Geistic Biomaterials, I'd like to say thank you very much for everybody that's logged in and for the team from Southern Dental for supporting this webinar. Thank you very much to Dental Campus. And of course, our special thank you go to Dr. Simon Wright for the excellent presentation tonight. Thank you and good night.